The Senate confirmation hearings for Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh were underway this week, with all the spectacle and total void of substance we all fully expected. Protesters dressed up as fictional characters to express fictional concerns about a fictional boogeyman. I hope they at least got that extra credit in their gender studies class. Protesters, of course, disrupted the hearing itself as well. Fact, those police were actually foisting her outside to her Kavanaugh-mandated back-alley abortion right there on the spot, not wasting any time. Democratic presidential hopefuls ask the tough questions in the hope of getting that precious CNN soundbite. Here's Kamala Harris. Judge, have you ever discussed special counsel Mueller or his investigation with anyone? Well, it's uh, in the news every day. I have you discussed it with anyone? Uh, with other judges, I know. Got him. Guilty. You know, the interesting thing about that question is there's no way to answer no honestly. Have I ever discussed the Mueller investigation? Why, yes, I have, Senator. With you. Right now. Cory Booker heroically demanded the release of additional documents on a nominee he already said he opposes unconditionally. We have a process here for a person the highest office in the land for a lifetime appointment. We're rushing through this before me and my colleagues can even read and digest the information. Why do you need to digest more information when you already said that voting for Kavanaugh is an act of evil? You are either complicit in the evil, you are either contributing to the wrong, or you are fighting against it. But I guess we need to figure out just how evil, like on a scale from Hitler to Satan. My favorite Kavanaugh wolf crying was from this advocacy group in Maine urging Senator Collins to vote against the nominee. If you vote yes on Kavanaugh, you're voting to kill me. Well, thankfully, we're not quite yet to the full Kavanaugh-calypse. At least we all get to watch the parliamentary prelude to our doom. And although it's been mostly useless spectacle so far, although pretty much every senator already knew how he or she was going to vote before before the man even entered the hearing room, there have been discussions of actual policy and case law sprinkled in. One such exchange was between Senator Dianne Feinstein of California and the nominee over the constitutionality of a so-called assault weapons ban. There's some necessary context to understand the exchange in full here. Feinstein authored the federal assault weapons ban that was in place from 1994 to 2004. Functionally, this bill just banned scary attachments to semi-automatic firearms. It was basically a game of pick one. You can have a pistol grip or a flash hider or a folding stock, but if you combine any of these features, suddenly your firearm magically becomes a military weapon, even though none of these attachments actually impact the ballistic performance, aka the deadliness of the weapon. On the other side, there's Brett Kavanaugh, who wrote a dissenting opinion in a 2011 DC gun rights case over the district's similar assault weapons ban, saying that this ban was unconstitutional under the Supreme Court's Heller precedent, because the the weapons that law was banning were in common use, common use being the test the Supreme Court established in the prior case regarding whether certain firearms can be constitutionally banned or not. With this understanding, Feinstein begins her questioning by arguing that her assault weapons ban was effective. My office wrote the assault weapons legislation in 1993. It was law from 94 to 2004. I happen to believe that it did work and that it was important. Two points here. One, efficacy is irrelevant to the constitutional question. A law against speech of certain persuasions might be effective in controlling those opinions, but that doesn't mean that such a law is square with the Constitution. And second, I don't care whether you personally believe the law worked or not, Senator. I care what the evidence says. A 1997 Justice Department study, quote, failed to produce evidence of a post-ban reduction in the average number of gunshot wounds per case case or in the proportion of cases involving multiple wounds in fact, because so-called assault weapons were used in such a small fraction of crimes and murders specifically, it was statistically difficult, if not impossible, to measure the law's effect. Now that analysis was short term. It was conducted only three years after the law's passage, using only one year of data, but the authors revisited the case in 2004, writing, quote, we cannot clearly credit the ban with any of the nation's recent drop in 
gun violence. And indeed, there has been no discernible reduction in the lethality and injuriousness of gun violence based on indicators like the percentage of gun crimes resulting in death or the share of gunfire incidents resulting in injury, as we might have expected had the ban reduced crimes with both assault weapons and large capacity magazines. But Diane Feinstein believes otherwise, and tough, she's the one with the law writing pen. Feinstein moves on to this common use test established by the Supreme Court, and this is where things get really detached from reality. She asks on what basis Kavanaugh concluded that assault weapons are in common use, and remember, her definition of assault weapon is just a semi-automatic firearm, meaning one round per trigger squeeze, with fancy pieces of plastic attached to it. You specifically argued that the D.C. assault weapons ban was unconstitutional, and I think because you said wep these weapons were in common use. What did you base your conclusion that assault weapons are in common use? And what evidence or study did you use to do that? The court in Heller, the Supreme Court, struck down a D.C. ban on uh, handguns, most of which are semi-automatic. And the question came before us of semi-automatic rifles, and the question was, can you distinguish as a matter of precedent? Again, this is all about precedent for me. And I concluded that uh, it could not be distinguished uh, as a matter of law, semi-automatic rifles from, uh, from semi-automatic handguns. Let me interrupt you because I, don't, I think we're on totally different wavelengths. I'm talking about your statement on common use, as common use being a justification and Assault weapons are not in common use. Feinstein's case here is really frustrating for a couple of reasons. First, she's actually being critical of Kavanaugh for following Supreme Court precedent. As a lower court judge, he is bound to the precedent set by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court says you can't constitutionally ban firearms that are in common use, so lower court judge Brett Kavanaugh says you can't constitutionally ban firearms that are in common use. She's criticizing him for following the rules to which he is bound, not for having a bad opinion. And secondly, not only are these weapons in common use, but the AR-15 rifle platform is the single most commonly owned rifle platform in the country. I recently bought one myself and it came off the rack at the store with a detachable magazine and a pistol grip and a flash hider. It's a real fine Steinian assault weapon. And that store rack had dozens of other similar models from different manufacturers with varying features. And why were there so many different options from which to choose? Because there is a market for them, because people buy them, because they are obviously in common use. But it gets worse. According to Feinstein, the actual commonality of the weapon is not what the phrase common use refers to. Instead, it's the type of use that matters. Semi-automatic rifles are widely possessed in the United States. There are millions and millions and millions. You're, you're opinion... saying the numbers determine common use? Common use is an activity. It's not common storage or possession, it's use. So what you said was that these weapons are commonly used. They're not. Yes, they are. Every single day. Target shooting, hunting, any number of other lawful purposes. And even if I don't personally take my rifle out every single day or even every week, its simple possession in my home is in fact itself useful. If a situation arises in which I must defend my life or property, it's actually critical. That usefulness does not pause for even a moment, ever. How do you reconcile what you've just said? with the hundreds of school shootings using assault weapons that have taken place in recent history. How do you reconcile that? Oh my fucking God, where do I even start? First off, hundreds of school shootings using assault weapons? Scrolling the Wikipedia aggregation of school shootings here, I can identify about seven cases since 1984. Maybe there are more, but I don't see evidence to support the claim that there have been hundreds of assault weapon school shootings. And in fact, the most famous example, Columbine, occurred during Feinstein's assault weapon ban. And the most deadly case, the Virginia Tech shooting, didn't use assault weapons at all, just handguns. Now granted, there have been many more mass shootings generally, 
generally beyond just school shootings, but that's not what Feinstein said. And since she's expecting extreme precision in Kavanaugh's words, I don't think it's unfair to expect precision in hers. But beyond that statistical untruth, Senator, you just finished establishing the premise that assault weapons, as you call them, are not in fact commonly used. And now you move on to say that they're used in hundreds of school shootings. They can't be both a common murder weapon and uncommonly possessed. You have to pick one premise and stick with it. And don't ask others to reconcile their perspectives when your perspective is diametrically irreconcilable. Now, the good thing is this exchange, just like the rest of this hearing, is nothing but a show. It's a formality so that everybody can say they're doing their jobs. Dianne Feinstein is voting against Brett Kavanaugh no matter what he says. Brett Kavanaugh is getting confirmed to the Supreme Court no matter what Dianne Feinstein says. And this discussion between them probably won't have any meaningful impact at all. But I did find this exchange telling and worthy of consideration as the gun control debate will surely arise again soon. Regardless of your opinion or mine on guns, whether they're adequately regulated at present or not, I hope we can all agree on this general idea. People regulating fundamental aspects of our lives lives, what we can do, what we can say, what we can possess or not, the people doing that regulating ought to at least have an understanding of what they're regulating. And it is abundantly clear, whether you like guns or not, Dianne Feinstein has almost no understanding of firearms or the manner in which Americans use them. And that is a reality that no American should be willing to accept. Whether you like the regulation, don't like the regulation, at bare minimum, it ought to be crafted by people who actually understand the issue. I'm just thankful that we have a system that has protected values in writing that are too important to be shredded by a legislature whims, and a prospective judge who still upholds that the text of that writing is all that matters, not what Dianne Feinstein happens to believe. Thanks as always for listening and for supporting this channel always. Appreciate that thoughtful discussion down below and especially over on Twitter that is at ML Christensen. You're always welcome to coming out and chatting my live streams. Those are linked down in the description. Looking forward to it. Okay, bye.